So you've heard of a victory garden and you want to build one, but you want to know, is it legal? Well, today on Wild Florida, we're going to talk about residential agriculture, victory gardens, and the law. Hi, I'm Jacqueline, the Wild Floridian, and welcome to episode eight of the nine part series where we go from a lawn to a victory garden in a snap. Victory Gardens are all about increasing food security, decreasing costs in a time of crisis. And if this is your first time joining us and you want to start from the beginning, go ahead and click on this card right here, or you can wait till the end of the episode and a card will appear in one of these four corners. Okay, let's get into it. Let's talk about Victory Gardens and the law. So before we get started, there's a big disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. I do not work for a legal firm. I do not have any legal expertise. I am just a resident and a citizen trying to inform people of things that already are out there, information collected together to help their understanding as they go and move forward in their victory gardens. So that's it. This is not legal advice. Mm -mm, Cause I don't know how to give that. Nope. Just me. Wild Floridian. Ha. So where did victory gardens start and why is that important? Well, if we remind ourselves when it comes to the law, we got to remember that Victory Gardens started during World War II as a federal program under the United States Department of Agriculture, right? They were supposed to be helping us increase our food security for the nation, both for our at-home residents and those who had gone abroad to go and fight the war. And also, we didn't talk about this a lot, but it was also to rally patriotism, right? Be American and grow some food. And people went and grew food everywhere. Their front yards, their backyards, their side yards, the alleyways, next to the park, next to the river, everywhere. And that's important to know because then something happened. Things started to change. So the 1950s, right? Everybody's come back from the war. They start going and building houses everywhere. And in those houses, right? They had to go and fill the land with something. So they filled it with grass, lots of grass, because grass is easy to put down quickly and cheaply and make it look nice. And thus changed the way we started to look at our yards and our personal property, right? We created an aesthetic value about, you know, grass looks good. Grass is a good thing to have. Grass increases our property value. Because before that, really, when people had lawns or grasses, they were, you know, royal. Not us mere peasants, not us everyday citizens. It was a royal thing. That's where literally lawns started. So let's get a little bit into why then would you get citations and fines or even a threat of jail? Well, because lawns just got very in, like that's the way we do things, right? We had to of course protect the lawns. We had to protect the grass, right? And all that comes with the grass. So when people start to do what we call residential agriculture or urban farming, suburban farming, all that kind of stuff, which includes your victory gardens, well, then there are kind of a couple areas that that's where the citations and fines come from. So the first part has to do with nuisance and the nuisance kind of breaks down into three areas, the sound, the smell, and then pests. So the sound really has to do with livestock typically. I mean, your tomatoes usually aren't making your whole racket, right? My, I mean, that would be weird if it does. So it usually has to do with the livestock. Typically first starter kit is chickens. Cause usually after people start getting into the vegetables and the fruit, at some point you're going to be thinking a lot about compost. And then you hear about how chicken poop is like really good for it. And Hey, you don't need a lot of land for chickens. So, you know, and then all of a sudden you got these clucking and crowing and all happening around your house and your neighbors. Well, they thought it was cool when you gave them some tomatoes, but now hmm, they didn't really like the alarm clock at uh, six in the morning when the sun came up. So yeah, they start to complain and the city not wanting, having neighbors not getting along. They're like, Hey, the chickens and the roosters, they gotta go. The second thing has to do with the smell. And again, livestock, whew, they top the board cause you know, their poop stinks. And so that usually, comes a problem with neighbors too. But even if you don't have livestock and you think this doesn't apply to me, Jacqueline, like, what are we talking about? I just want to have a victory garden with some like, you know, kale and spinach in it. Well, remember we talked about how you could quickly and easily increase the fertility and the soil amending of your yard was through compost. And yes, compost can smell. If you get it imbalanced, like, ooh, it smells really bad. So, that can become a complaint. And again, if it's just for a day or two, cities may not step in if they don't have specific ordinances. But um, if it's a long-term thing, yeah, 
yeah, they'll basically be like, you're creating a landfill and it's got to go. The next thing is those compost or your fruit and vegetables may start attract pests. And this one, cities and counties definitely will step in. If you've got out of control pests, right? I'm not talking about, you've got the flies, you've got the rats, you've got the raccoons, you've got the possums, they're everywhere. And now all of a sudden they're getting more and more involved in everybody's lives, not just your yards. Well, now it becomes a safety and health issue, right? Because we can't have animals going and biting and spreading rabies or just biting. That's bad. Adults or children, this is just not a good look. They don't want that. So they're going to quickly shut you down for those kind of things. So again, they might not have specific ordinances, but if it's going to affect people's safety and health, or it's just gonna really annoy your neighbors, they may start stepping in, even if they don't have explicit laws that stop you from growing fruits and vegetables. The second part really then has to do with aesthetics, right? Because the lawn, it's the look. It's the look everybody has to have, right? I mean, who doesn't want a well-groomed lawn? Well, you know, we don't. So, and yeah. And while it can often be okay for you to get away with stuff in your backyard and side yard, often once you move into your front yard, well, there's when the problems really come up because now you've reduced curbside appeal. You know, you've stopped the look. And it falls under to two general areas, kind of just general aesthetics and reduction of property values. Now, general aesthetics will be like, you know, they just think the look is not a good look. Um, and there can be some valid points here, right? If your lawn looks crazy and you've got just like stuff growing out of everywhere and you know, it doesn't have an organized design, they'll really push you. Even if they allow for stuff, even if there are laws for vegetable and fruit gardening and urban agriculture, you know, they will push if it just is totally out of control. So be aware of that. Keeping it generally groomed looking is important. I know I talked about scatter seeds and all that, but like if you just got like weeds and stuff growing all crazy through everything, they're gonna push you to be like, yeah, is that really an urban farm? I don't think so, it's gotta go. So keeping it generally like not looking, I'll call it not looking crazy because it doesn't have to have the rows to be considered well kept. The next thing is gonna be all about reducing property prices, yeah. Yeah. And why does the government care about you reducing property prices? Well, you know, taxes. Because the more your property's worth, well, the more taxes they get. And the next thing is, is that by having higher property prices, it attracts better business and therefore creates better things for the general community. So all things that usually politicians run their platforms off of. So they're not really looking for things that are gonna reduce property values, right? All right, I mean, it's just the reality. But I think this is where the problem comes in, is where the mindset of what property value comes across as. So I learned a new word the other day, and it was not because I was looking up this, I was actually on TikTok, and I learned a word called skewmorph, S-K-E-U-M-O-R-P-H. This is where something that was originally had some functional value has now drifted into only having aesthetic value. And as I was learning about that word, I thought, gosh, doesn't that just sound like our yards? You know, because let's talk a little bit about property value. Now, when you usually talk to a realtor and they talk about property value, what they usually talk about is resale value. Yep, when your house goes to be sold, is it gonna be worth more than what you bought it for? So if you bought a house that was 100 grand, and then, you know, down the road you go to sell it and you did all these lovely things to your house, or maybe nothing, just the area got more popular and people wanna live there, maybe your house is going for 150,000. And now you have just increased your property value by $50,000. Yay! And isn't that amazing? <laughs> but this generally is a very modern interpretation of property value. See, typically when people got property, historically speaking, they wanted to keep it in their family for, you know, generations. So the value of the property was not based on resale value, it was based on intrinsic value. It was based on the value of the function of the land, you know, the resources it had. Did it have rivers on it so you had access to one, water, and two, maybe some fish? Or did you have some woods on it so you had access to, you know, lumber and maybe some forest animals that you could go eat? And very explicitly, land value was very much derived from the fact of the food you could grow on it, you know, like cattle and pork and all those vegetables and fruit, right? So the intent was always to gain land so that you could continually drive value through the crops and the resources that you could get from your land. And that would then add value to your family. 
So this weird shift has now happened where the value of our land is based on an aesthetic appeal instead of the value that the land is actually creating for ourselves. And the only way we can get the value out is by selling it instead of the value that it actually has. I know that sounded a little confusing, but it's a little crazy to me, right? So by having a grass lawn that actually provides no value to me and actually is generally a detriment to the environment um, and costs me money and I have to pay, you know, either I have to take care of the yard, so I have to use my personal time or I have to pay someone to take care of my yard. And then I have to put resource into, resources into it like seeds and fertilizers and pesticides, you know, so I have to spend money on it. Somehow it's going to gain me long-term value instead of changing it into something that's literally going to produce value by growing fruits and vegetables for my family. My case rests, my case rests. Okay. <laughs> I am really excited for this episode. I've been looking forward to doing something like this all year. I didn't know this. I was going to, you know, I just, I'm really excited about this. Just very excited. <laughs> You're probably thinking that I hate grass. No, we have not removed all our grass. I have a yard in my back because I've got little kids and they like to run around on it. So don't think that I'm a hater on grass. There is some value to have just some general grassy lawns, but I don't think that should be the reason why we don't grow food. Okay, so I just wanna make that clear right here. Again, not a lawyer. <laughs> So, but let's now get into two different state laws and I want to compare two different ones. I want to compare California's 2561 and Florida Senate Bill 82. And the reason is, is because one was done under a Democratic administration and the other under a Republican. And I don't mean at the national level because this is really about state laws. And I want to walk you through kind of the background of both laws and then therefore what the laws say, because you know what, what's interesting is they start off differently and they actually kind of reflect typical um wording what's the word value systems of each party but they kind of end up at the same spot in the end which is kind of cool i think so again i'm gonna put a disclaimer i am not a lawyer i am not a legal historian or any of that kind of stuff um this is just me you know googling stuff and um interpreting what i've read yeah okay not legal advice <laughs> Could you imagine? I got legal advice from the wild Floridian. Could you imagine that standing in a case? No. So let's start with California Assembly Bill 2561 and Civil Code 1940.10, which really were inspired by a couple of things. First, the 2011 census. It said California was number one. Good job, California, because you were number one in poverty rates. Yay. Yeah. So, right, and if we wanna allow people to increase food security and reduce costs, well, after mortgage and rents, well, food's number two. So it was only logical over in California, which had at the time a Democratic governor, Jerry Brown, they passed this law into effect in 2014, right? So it only made sense that they made a law that allowed people to start growing food on their property. And the 1940.10, specifically civil code, is that it allowed them to then also use rented space, right? So even if you were a renter and there was property that you were renting, you could also grow fruits and vegetables. Yay. And the next thing that their um, surveys also showed was that, you know, in California, they were doing such a great job of 30 to 60% of their water use was being used for one type of crop. That's right, grass. Yay. Cause grass is super useful. Oh, right, it's not but it's aesthetically pleasing. And in this drought ridden and fire prone state, this seemed like a poor use of water, right? So we could increase food security, reduce costs, and make sure that resources that were in tight supply, well, they could be used for things that actually help people instead of watering an aesthetically appealing plant. And so that's how the Democratic state of California in 2014 approved laws that then protected what would become you know, urban agriculture, residential agriculture, suburban farming, and of course, our victory gardens. Yay. And you can see how it started. It really demonstrates how kind of one of those core value systems to the Democratic Party is the social issues, right? The greater social good becomes the heart of their bill. Cool. So now let's go to the East Coast and down South, right where I live here in Florida. And let's talk about Florida Senate Bill 82. This bill passed in 2019, so not that long ago, under a Republican administration with Ron DeSantis as our governor. And really, how did this bill start? Well, it started in 2013. Mm -hmm. 
down in Miami shore. So there was a family that had been growing fruits and vegetables in their front yard for 17 years. See their backyard. Well, it was pretty shaded. So they were using their front yard and they were a retired couple. One was a Jamaican architect and really it was a way for them to get outside, find that sense of peace and reduce their costs. I think they said up to 50% of their food came out of their front yard, which is amazing, right? Amazing. And what a great way to reduce costs and stay healthy and get outside. But then the problem came is that Miami Shorts changed some of their local civil codes and said that vegetable gardens weren't aesthetically pleasing. And therefore, this family, which had been growing food for 17 years in their yard, now all of a sudden has to rip it all out because vegetables aren't aesthetically pleasing. Are you kidding me? It's crazy. And then it's threatened with a daily fine of $50 to a retired couple. I mean, so they go and contact the Institute of Justice and start a six year battle that goes all the way through the Florida Supreme Court to get the right to be able to grow fruits and vegetables in their front yard. And that bill passed July 1st of 2019. Yay! And when that bill passed in July 1st of 2019, it explicitly says that no local, city, county, or state laws shall stop a personal residential owner from growing food on their yard. Yep. So they can grow fruits, they can grow vegetables, and the only caveat is if we're in times of drought that they can go and mitigate some of your water usage. But otherwise, go for it. Right. And so because I said this was under a Republican administration, this was all about personal rights for property rights. So a little bit different than a grander social issue. It was more about personal property rights and being able to use your land for, you know, food. So I wanted to highlight this because I think it's really interesting that basically two different laws that have two different origin stories basically end up at the same place, right? One's trying to resolve social issues on a grander scale and reduce both from environmental and from a social side. And the other is trying to protect personal property rights and they both end up at the same place. You get to grow food on your yard. Yeah, so pretty cool, right? So even if your city or state or county doesn't specifically allow it, you know, there are paths forward, whether you have Democrats or Republicans in charge, and it doesn't matter if it lines up with your political party, understanding kind of the value systems of both political parties then allows you to find a way to go and advocate for yourself. So if you have Republicans, go and talk about your personal right to grow what you want to on your personal property. Government, get out of my yard, right? I need to rebel and grow some fruits and vegetables. Or if you're in a democratic state, talk about the greater good, right? Increasing food security, removing issues that are on a greater scale. You could be donating this. You could be helping the greater welfare of the world. See, and all of a sudden everybody's winning and we're all growing food. Yay. And there's less grass for us to all just, you know, look at. Now this would be the part where I tell you, Hey, go to this website and you can find out if your state has a law that allows you to grow food. And I'm going to tell you after doing research, I focus mostly on the big states first, you know, where we'll have a lot of population. And the general answer is, no, there's not a law and finding it out for each state becomes really difficult. So really then what it becomes about is it's usually city laws. It's not even county, it's city laws that then have the next jurisdiction. And there are things in a lot of big cities, which I could not go through all big cities in a video. This video would go on for days, but you can go and look into your specific city. Now you may end up finding that in your city, well, it's not legal or it's not explicit. Well, you can push the boundaries, you know, rebel a little bit and go and just grow something. I mean, just like that family. And remember, things are changing. So I wanted to point out those two laws because they're pretty recent. Even California, which is known for being very progressive and environmentally friendly. I mean, it was 2014 and Florida, which has been about personal rights and stand your ground. That was only 2019. I mean, those are pretty recent and that's pretty shocking. The fact that we were having a lot of the nation growing as food in the forties and it's not that long that we're now having people go, I want to grow food. Is it legal? which is crazy to me. So look up actually more your specific city. Now you may end up being in the position that you start to grow food and then someone comes along and says they need to find you. So the thing that you want to do is one, always try to talk through things first Two, the next thing you want to do, of course, protect your finances at first because you don't want to get yourself into legal trouble. But if you want legal help, what you want to reach out to is the Institute of justice. That is who helped the family down in Miami to go and get that bill passed they fought for six years 
and also we leverage things like those Facebook groups we've talked about, right? Other gardeners and food growers. There's a lot of people out there. This movement has not stopped. It's actually growing more and more. And with global crises continuing to come along, there's more and more interest. So it is in generally in elected officials benefit to go ahead and start figuring out ways to make it legal to grow food and have it in a more controlled way instead of everyone going like, pew, 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 it's the wild west, let's just do whatever we want. <laughs> Cause that generally just doesn't work out well. <laughs> so just to make it hundred percent clear for my Floridians, yes, it is legal for you to grow fruits and vegetables in your front yard, your backyard and your side yard, no matter where you live in the state, except and that's gonna be our last episode, episode nine. We're gonna talk about Victory Gardens versus HOAs. Yeah. So to make sure you don't miss that, go ahead and like, subscribe, and ring that bell for notification. New videos each week. And yes, while you wait for the next video to come out, if you want to dig deeper into growing food, check out the Growing Food is Easy Challenge, or check out Growing Food is Easy for inspiration for other foods to go grow. Or if you wanna think native, think look at True Florida Native and go grow some native plants too helps out your pollinators. The pollinators help you grow more food. So do that. All right. I'll see you soon. Bye. You like my shirt? I did choose this for a reason. <laughs>